Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about a distinction within metaphysics between essential and accidental properties. Uh, and I'm going to begin with an abstract philosophical distinction, and then I'm going to apply it uh, to some uh, various situations, some of which might wind up being somewhat controversial. Uh, so forewarning for the second part of the video, uh, that is what's coming. However, I will keep it strictly, straightforwardly philosophical, at least for the first section. So check the timestamps below if that's all you're after. Or if you already are familiar with the distinction, want to skip ahead to the juicy parts. So this is a distinction that was common to almost every uh, philosophical school of thought, at least before the Enlightenment, and even most schools of thought after uh, and including the Enlightenment, uh, which is uh, the essence of something uh, or its essential properties and the accidents of something or its accidental properties. These two sorts of properties that a thing can have are the difference between what it is fundamentally and what it has. Uh, we might also say in philosophy, it is the difference of the is of identity uh, or even the is of existence, what something is in terms of its essential qualities and the is of predication, which is a quality that is attributed or predicated of something, of some being or some object. A difference, uh, an example actually might help to illustrate this difference. Uh, so if I look to my cup of coffee, for example, coffee has certain essential properties and certain accidental properties. Some of the essential properties of coffee are its nutritional values. For example, if it didn't have certain nutritional values deriving from its chemical compositions, it wouldn't be coffee. Uh, that includes things like it being caffeinated. And so coffee, even decaf coffee, has trace amounts of caffeine. You can't get rid of all of it without getting rid of the coffee itself. You can't have fully decaffeinated coffee, coffee with no caffeine whatsoever. And so caffeine is a good example of an essential property of coffee. It is something without which the thing would not be the thing that we're describing. In other words, if the essential properties differed, then the thing itself would have to be a different kind of thing. However, there are also lots of accidental properties of coffee, in particular, this cup of coffee. Uh, for example, uh, this is an African coffee. This is from Rwanda. It could perfectly well have had a different uh, region or country of origin. This could have been an uh, a, a sort of, uh, Asian coffee. This could have been South American. It could have been from all sorts of different places and still been coffee without it changing fundamentally what the what is actually in here. It is, as you may be able to see, black. Uh, so it doesn't have cream and sugar. It perfectly well could have been, uh, it could have had cream and sugar or both or neither or one or the other, and it still would be coffee. It would still be fundamentally the same type of thing. It would still have the same essential properties, even though its accidental properties would change. Uh, we can list any number of these, right? For example, it's temperature. This is hot. This is relatively fresh and therefore it is a hot cup of coffee. And therefore it it could have been differently. It has certain, this is an accidental property because it could have cooled off, right? So if I let this sit out on my desk for some length of time, then after a while, it'll cool off. It won't be hot anymore, but it'll still be coffee. It'll still maintain its essential properties while its accidental properties change. It, it remains the same thing. The essence remains the same, it remains stable. However, its accidents or the, the qualities that it just so happens to have contingently change. Another example might be me, a human being. I am essentially human. That is, I am a rational animal. I am, a, uh, I am an animal in that I am a living organism, a living and physical biological organism, and I am essentially rational. I am, uh, I am at least intrinsically capable of abstract reason. Um, because I am a human being, that is what I essentially am, if I were to lose either of those properties, if I were to either lose my physicality, in other words, pass out of being, um, or lose my rationality, and fundamentally basically being brain dead, uh, then I would no longer be a human being. I would have died functionally. Uh, however, if my various accidental properties may, would change, then I would still remain what I fundamentally am. Uh, for example, if my beard were to be shaven, I might look ridiculous, but I would still be a human being. I would still be fundamentally the same kind of creature that I am. Um, if my hair were longer, as it has been in the past, I would still be the same fundamental person. Uh, if my eyes worked, I mean, my eyes don't work quite well. I wear glasses, at least in this video, and sometimes I wear contact lenses, and I need them to see. 
Uh, I can't see uh, anything particularly well without these, but if I could, say if I got LASIK eye surgery or if I didn't, uh, if I didn't read so much and point lasers in my eyes as a small child, then, well, perhaps my eyes would have functioned, but I would still be fundamentally the same type of thing. My essential properties, my humanity, would remain the same even though my accidental properties might differ. All right, so here's the that is the basic difference I think this illustrates. Um, but there is something else that we should add to this, which are uh, what certain scholastic philosophers, including Thomas Aquinas, refer to as proper accidents. These are accidental properties. In other words, they're properties that a, a certain kind of thing can have or not. They can have it or they can have it differently. They're contingent. They're, they're not essential to what it is to be the thing. However, it is essential to the kind of thing to have one such property. It's just that what, what specific property the thing has can differ. For example, if I'm talking about a body that is a physical object with mass, it is essential to any body, any physical object with mass, that it be physical, it, it have mass, and it, has, uh, it, it is composed of matter, it takes up space. These are the essential properties of physical matter. However, there are also certain accidental properties of matter that it might have. For example, matter might be configured into, uh, into uh, you know, a pen, for example, or a cup of coffee, to use our previous example. And so it, the particular configuration does not change its essential properties as matter, as a material, as material object, as a body with mass. However, there are also certain qualities that any body, any uh, physical object with mass must have, but not specifically. So for example, a pen. I take the pen for example. This is a physical object with mass. It is essential to any physical object with mass that it be colored, but not that it be of a specific color. If this pen were, for example, red, eh, bad example. I don't have a red pen. I have a black pen. If the pen were black, for example, then it would be a perhaps a different pen, but it would still be a physical object, right? You cannot come up with a physical object with no color. That is no reflective properties whatsoever, or else it would not be a physical object. It would be fundamentally invisible, and so that would be intangible and would not exist as a physical thing with extension. It also has to have a certain mass, right? So, for example, this pen weighs a couple of ounces. Physical objects can weigh anywhere from almost zero to almost infinity, but it can't be zero and it can't be infinity. It has to have a specific mass for it to be a physical object. To take the coffee example, coffee being a physical object and also being a liquid has to have a certain temperature. We were talking before about this being hot, being fresh. Say it's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It is currently over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It could, of course, be less than that, but it has to have some temperature. To say that it has a temperature is to, is to say that it has a one of a, a, an innumerable series, in this case, of proper accidents. It could be any, any particular range of temperatures, but it has to have some temperature to it in order for it to be a, a, a liquid, a physical body with mass, something that is, in fact, there coffee as well, uh, to be a little bit more specific than just physical bodies with mass, has to be from somewhere. There are only certain places that coffee grows. And so it is a proper accident of this coffee in particular that it's from Africa, which is one of the places that coffee grows. However, it could have been from somewhere else. It could have been from Asia. It could have been from South America. It could have been from, from a uh, sort of a greenhouse grow lab kind of thing somewhere else in the world. But it had to have been from somewhere, right? It's origin is a proper accident of the cup of coffee. If it hadn't been from somewhere, it wouldn't exist. In other words, the fact that something has proper accidents at all is essential to it, but what those accidents are are merely accidental. Another example of this might be, take me again as a human being. I am essentially a rational animal. I am accidentally blonde. If my hair had been a different color, if my hair had been darker, uh, or if my hair had been lighter for that matter, if I had white hair, 
I would still fundamentally be a human being, and I would even be this particular human being. There'd be nothing about me that would fundamentally change, and nothing about my essence which would change if my hair had a different color. However, because my hair is a physical object, it has to have some color. And so this is part of being a rational animal, but in particular a mammal. Mammals have hair of a, sp of a certain color. Now what that color is, is could be almost anything. Uh, at least anything that we're biologically capable of producing, or unnaturally capable of dying. But in a case like that, I have to have hair of some color. Even if I don't grow it, I mean, even if I shaved my entire head completely bald, my hair would still fundamentally be blonde, because that's the hair it would, that's the color it would grow if it did grow. It's fundamentally part of the kind of creature, the kind of animal that I am, is that I grow hair, and something that is a proper accident of me in particular is that I have blonde hair. This is my natural hair color. This is the color that it will naturally grow. Okay, so we have this distinction between essence and accident, and we have this middle ground of proper accidents. Now, um, this is hopefully uh, a pretty uh, straightforward and hopefully relatively thorough uh, explanation of the difference within metaphysics, right? The metaphys metaphysical difference between these two types of properties uh, that something can have. Uh, now I want to move on to uh, to a few applications of uh, of this distinction. Some of which are uh, some of which are somewhat controversial. Some of which are in the news, that sort of thing. Uh, so buckle up. Here we go. Uh, first of all, uh, the one that occurs to me most uh, most distinctly when I'm talking about accidents and uh, and essence, uh, that is being Catholic, of course, is uh, is the Eucharist. The Eucharistic miracle is explained. Uh, in uh, particularly by Thomas Aquinas, as what's called transubstantiation. What this means is that the Eucharist, the, the, the bread, the host that is raised up by the priest at the Mass, its essential properties change. Its essence changes to the body and blood of Christ. That is, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of God. Its accidents, that are that is, its visible properties, its accidental properties remain the same. So it becomes a different thing with the same accidental properties. This would be like if I were to uh, to take a, again, a cup of coffee, and I were to replace this cup of coffee with tea. And if I were to replace the cup of coffee with tea, say, from Africa, say, still having roughly the same temperature, say, still having roughly the same caffeine content, because the level of caffeine content is a proper accident of coffee. If I were to change all those things, I'd be, if I were to keep all those things the same while changing what it fundamentally is, changing it out for tea, it would be fundamentally a different thing with the same accidental properties. The difference is, of course, that this happens miraculously at the Mass, or at least so Catholics believe. Um, so this was religiously controversial. What about, uh, what, I hesitate to say politically, but what we think of as politically today, a, a controversial topic of, uh, say, gender identity or sexual orientation, these sorts of things. This is where things get odd because I've observed that in our culture, uh, at least in our culture today, we have a tendency to invert or at least confuse uh, essential from accidental properties, especially of ourselves. We think of ourselves as uh, as merely accidentally alive, human. These what I would think are essential properties. But we think of our our mere accidents as essential. What do I mean? For example, if I were to ask, um, uh, if I were to ask somebody who identifies as LGBT. Uh, somewhere on the sort of LGBT spectrum, um, whether uh, whether to deny their sexuality or their sexual identity, uh, or to criticize their their sexuality or the, their sexual identity, uh, if I were to do that, or if I were to ask what they would think of someone doing that, they would often and you'll find this very very commonly. Uh, you would find that they see this as a sort of attack on their very being. In other words, they see what I would call accidental properties, gender identity, uh, sexuality, or sexual orientation or inclination, um, various choices that we make, things like this, 
I and traditional philosophers would see these as accidents. These are mere accidents to our to our essential being. They see these things as, as essential. And this is why you find the criticism of uh, of sort of anti-LGBT people you are criticized as denying their uh, denying the existence of, say, um, gay people or or anyone on on this in this sort of identity group. However, these critics are clearly not denying their existence. Even if even if someone were to say that there are no such thing as gay people and there are arguments to be made, I suppose, um, and I, I can point to some uh, to some arguments along those lines. It's not what you might think, uh, but arguments along those lines, you can, I'll put in the description of the video. But if someone were to make that that sort of argument, they are certainly not denying the existence of the people in question. They're denying that these people have these accidental characteristics that they claim to, or defining them or understanding them in a fundamentally different way. That's all that's going on here. It's not a denial of someone's essence, but rather a denial of accidents or an argument about accidents rather than an argument about essence. We're not arguing about our common humanity. We obviously share that. The argument rather is about accidental qualities that we may or may not have. And I think it's important to keep that difference in mind, so we don't start uh, to confuse our uh, our our uh, our mere accidents as something far more essential to us. Uh, because again, even the very important things, the things I, I think are very crucial to my identity, for example, my uh, say my family or my faith, right, which I mentioned already, um, all of these things are very fundamental to my identity. However, they are still accidental properties of me. I would still be the same human being. Certainly, I would still be a human being, and I would still exist if I were not Catholic. If I, uh, if I hadn't, uh, if I hadn't, uh, if I hadn't been raised in the faith, or if I hadn't come to take it seriously as an adult, or if I had left the faith, I would still be me. Right? I would still essentially be the same person, even if the accidents, uh, uh, even if my accidental characteristics, even very important ones different. And the same goes for family. If I had never met my wife, uh, if I had, uh, if, if my life had gone a different direction and say I had taken my faith still quite seriously and I'd become a priest, I would still be essentially the same person with different, very important, but still accidental characteristics. And this is a very important distinction to remember because by confusing these two, by taking accidents as essential, we're tempted to take our essential attributes and our essential characteristics as merely accidental. What do I mean by that? Well, there are two dangers here. First of all, one can argue, and this is related to something I've discussed before, that this is in some way responsible for, uh, for um, gender ideology, we might say, uh, for, um, for taking one's gender identity as more fundamental uh, than, one's, uh, than one's biological sex essential to oneself. Uh, and it, supposing these things can vary independently, which again, not the topic of this video, uh, either the relationship between them or how they can vary, we have to say at least that biological sex is a proper accident, that one must have one or the other, uh, essentially speaking, to be a human being, to be a biological organism uh, of the mammalian sort. And so, to, to take that as merely accidental, uh, to take the fact that one is sexed or gendered or using whichever terminology you prefer, uh, to take that as accidental and to replace it with, with uh, an accidental characteristic like one's social identity or, or one's, uh, one's gender expression uh, or any of these things, uh, is to fundamentally invert what we are as, well, our animality. The other danger is, I think, more pressing, right? Because this, the, what I've been talking about here is very abstract. Uh, yes, it has impacts on things, but again, it's, it's, it's quite high level. The other danger here is to start taking our existence as accidental. We can start dismissing our importance within the world because we, we think of ourselves first and foremost as something we identify with rather than ourselves. It is a kind of, a kind of emphasis on what we identify as and what we identify with over and above our own 
reality, our own personal essence, our essential identity, which is me as a human person, as a particular human person, say. It's a kind of, uh, if we want to put it in, again, political terms, it's a kind of emphasis on the collective that one participates in rather than on the individual, him or herself. Right? So I am fundamentally me. What that means is that whatever identity group I, I happen to be a part of takes a secondary role to that. Whereas if I take the accidents external to myself as more essential than what I should be taking as my essential characteristics, then what winds up happening is my existence becomes superfluous, even to myself. And I start placing the things in which I participate before me in my order of prioritization, and even my way of conceiving of myself. And this has dangers for our own personal identity, as well as uh, as well as practical implications of how we live our lives, how we interact with other people, and how we interact as a, as a society. All right, now I want to look uh, away from somewhat more controversial things, although maybe there will still be some controversy here, who knows. Um, but I want to look, rather than at some sort of abstract philosophical things, at the more symbolic structures within society, within social organization. Uh, and to this, I will um, I'll nod to uh, Jonathan Peugeot, a symbologist who I've recommended before uh, on several occasions, who does a lot of work uh, examining the relationship between the margin and the center of society. And I want to try and analogize uh, this symbolic margin and center to accidental and essential characteristics. He's pointed out several times uh, now from his uh, from his review of his review and analysis of the movie Shrek to a relatively recent interview uh, as of this recording with uh, Michael Knowles, um, a sort of cultural inversion of the margin with the center that the margin has in large part and at least in some sectors of society replaced the center as the new norm, the what is fundamentally abnormal, which defines itself as being separate from the norm, has become the norm. And so it's an unstable norm. What I would argue is that we see a similar thing happening here with essence and accident. That if we are to take our accidental properties as essential, what that means is that our identity, just like the sort of social organization in which we find ourselves, winds up being unstable because our accidents are, can only exist, can only be defined properly in relation to our essence, right? Our accidental properties can only inhere in something with a certain essential makeup, essential nature. If it doesn't have a stable essence, then it can't have these accidental properties. And if we make these accidental properties an, our new essence, our new center, then the margin is cut free doesn't, it, there's nothing for it to latch onto, and you can't have stable and comprehensible accidental qualities to map onto this accidental quality that we're taking to be essential. It was a mouthful. Um, but I think here what we wind up seeing is, uh, is a point that can be traced back at least to Plato, uh, where in, uh, this is another odd digression, but related to some of the other things I've mentioned, is that, uh, for example, in the Republic, um, Plato gives us a series of analogies uh, about the well-governed city, or the well-governed polis, or society. And the reason he does this is not to explain anything political. It's to explain something about the fundamental makeup and nature of the human soul. How are we? How ought we to govern ourselves? How ought we to act? How ought we to behave? It is essentially um, a treatise on, or a dialogue, I suppose, on moral psychology more so than politics, despite it being titled The Republic, The Public Thing, Res Publica. And the reason he makes this connection is because Plato has this assumption that the whole will resemble the part, and the part will resemble the whole. He understood, and a lot of, a lot of philosophers following Plato in, in all sorts of Eastern and Western traditions will follow this, understood reality as deeply fractal. That parts of things will resemble the whole that they make up in their fundamental structure. And so what we find now, I think, is uh, what, I'm in, what I'm trying to point out here is a connection between this fundamental confusion on the societal level, where the margin is becoming the center, and the center is 
is moving to the periphery and is getting cast off uh, because there's no stable center anymore. This is the large picture. This is the whole. But we see this resemblance with the part where we take on these accidental properties as essential to ourselves and therefore our essence, our human, our fundamental human nature gets cast off and evanesces. It, it falls away from our newly constructed or self-constructed essence. You can blame all sorts of things for this. There are, there are historical trends within philosophy that we can point to. Uh, you can look to the existentialist tradition, which has which has a point of doing this, which makes um, uh, our existence precede our essence. The the the, uh, the phrasing of uh, of uh, Jean Paul Sartre. Uh, you have uh, you have the political trends of the sort of uh, post structuralists, which do this on a societal level. Uh, you have all sorts of things that you can point to here uh, throughout the 20th century and before, but. Again, I think, suffice it to say, that uh, the, the most important thing of note, or the most interesting thing to me at least of note, is that these things wind up coinciding. Uh, that we have this, this inversion of margin and center uh, at a social level at the same time as we find a lot of people individually struggling with an inversion of accident and essence. So. Hopefully, uh, in this lecture, I've done a, a fair job of explaining the basic metaphysical and philosophical difference between these terms. And then, hopefully, we found some of the discussions um, uh, perhaps interesting, perhaps uh, perhaps provocative, or or, uh, or causing you to think. Right? Provocative in the sense of making you think about it, wrestle with difficult ideas, because that's something I enjoy doing. And all philosophers typically uh, enjoy doing, and I hope you do as well. So... Hopefully we've learned something, we've gotten something new to think about, so I'll see you next time.